Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to this evening's program with artist Jordan Castile, who is currently featured in a solo exhibition at the museum titled Jordan Castile Within Reach, and author and editor Hanya Yanihara, who will interview Castile about her creative practice. This is the first time the two have spoken together in public, and convenings like this are core to the new museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank Daisy Nam, as well as education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, for their help bringing this program together. New Museum Digital Initiatives are generous, generously supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. Jordan Castile lives and works in New York City and is Assistant Professor of Painting in the Department of Arts, Culture and Media at Rutgers University, Newark. Prior to her current solo exhibition at the New Museum, her solo exhibition, Jordan Castile, Returning the Gaze, was presented at both the Denver Art Museum and the Iris and B. Gerald Cantor Center for Visual Arts at Stanford University. In recent years, she has participated in exhibitions at institutional venues such as Baltimore Museum of Art, Crystal Bridges Museum of Art, MoCA Los Angeles, the Studio Museum, and Mass MoCA. Castile has been an artist in residence at Lower Manhattan Cultural Council Process Space, the Studio Museum, and the Sharp Valenta Studio Program. Castile received her BA in Studio Art from Agnes Scott College in 2011, and her MFA in Painting and Printmaking from Yale School of Art in 2014. Hanya Yanagihara is the author of two novels, The People in the Trees, 2013, and A Little Life, 2015, for which was she was a finalist for the Man Booker Prize, the National Book Award, and the Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction, and won the Kirkus Award. She is editor-in-chief of T, the New York Times style magazine. And now a few logistical notes before we begin. This program will last for one hour. If time allows, we may have a brief Q&A at the end. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer questions during the Q&A at the end of the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to Hanya Yanagihara and Jordan Castillo. Andrew, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to everyone who's uh, listening in now and especially to Jordan uh, for being here. You know, I wanted to just say a few words and embarrass Jordan a little bit, and then we'll get straight to the conversation, which is really just questions that I've always wanted to ask her. So this is really, you know, a very selfish thing for, opportunity for me. But I first saw her work about five years ago and I found it utterly arresting as I think everyone who sees it does. It wasn't just her technical mastery or the confidence and daring behind it. It was that you could look at it and sense the generosity and the empathy of the person who made them. They were sincere, but clear-eyed. They took their subjects seriously, but they weren't somber. The artist placed herself in a position of humility and yet her tenderness was palpable. They were mature works, not just in their execution, but in the understanding of their subjects. There was nothing condescending or patronizing about their gaze. They were quiet, but they demanded your attention. And now here we are honoring her solo show, uh, not the first and certainly not the last at the New Museum. It's always a thrill, you know, to watch someone truly talented be recognized for who they are. And I've been one of the many odd bystanders who's not only gotten to watch Jordan's rise, but the poise, humor and grace with which she's responded to it, which is very difficult to do in an overheated um, uh, cultural moment. So Jordan, I'm really honored to be with you tonight. And I want to begin this interview the way I always begin interviews with people who have been interviewed a lot, um, especially as you know, in a kind of fast and furious manner that you have. And I want to ask you, 
what is the one question you never want to be asked again and why? Um, so I can't, I mean, I'm gonna answer that question, but I just also have to say that that was one of the most generous and thoughtful introductions I've possibly ever had. Oh, and of well. course it would come from you because reading your book, A Little Life was one of the most generous and thoughtful experiences I ever had and my attachment to that book was immediate and your words and your sense of empathy and seeing people was profound. Um, I felt akin to you without knowing you and to know you and to have you give an introduction and be in this space with me is a real gift and honor. Thank so you. I have to say that first and foremost. Um, okay. got this. Well, thank you and good night. <laughs> yeah, thank you, good night, thanks guys. Um, no, but we got this because I do think that there's something that we have in common and I felt that and what you just described means that you're also feeling that around the work that I'm producing yeah. as well. And um, the thing that I, I thought about when you um, first posed this question, you, luckily you were nice enough to give me some time to think about this in advance because there are so many things that I often feel I get pigeonholed into that yeah. the question that I could like be done with is like, what does it mean to be a black woman making this work? Or yeah. um, why do you care about social justice singularly? Yeah. Or do you only care about blackness? Or all of those, like everything that has to do with my appearance in the world. And yeah. yes, my experience in the world, but nothing to do with my skill as a painter. <laughs> so I yeah. often find myself exhausted by kind of the repetition of questions centered around um, my experience as a black woman and yeah. not as much about my experience as a painter and giving yeah. me the privilege to kind of like lead with that um, because yeah. that's why I lead when I enter the campus. I can't say that every time I'm putting brush to canvas that I'm like thinking about, I'm a black woman, you know, like I, those things are true. I'm, yeah. I'm just enjoying the lusciousness of the material and I'm thinking conceptually as well. Um, so those are questions that I don't often have the opportunity to engage in, but um, the other ones I get a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult whenever you are some sort of othered artist, because it, you know, the question, the first round of questions is always about um, about your identity as, you know, on the screen or on the page or on the canvas. And they're very, they're, they're less about technique and they're less about, and not that the two are separable, you know, who you are as you move through the world and how you see things and who you are as a technical master. But it is wearying, I think. And it's a lazy question to always be asked um, how the identity foregrounds the work when often, I mean, I certainly think, and I wonder if you do too, that when you're actually working, the thing you're not thinking about actively is how you're othered in the culture, because that's innate. What you're thinking about is how does the sentence sound? How does this color look? It, it, is, it is so much a part of who you are, but it's not conscious, I think, um, or for me at least, I don't know about you. Same. I mean, I'm nodding curiously because I think that's exactly right. It's not a conscious engagement. The things that are conscious or the people want to kind of like build off of is that which is kind of familiar in the culture and in the language that's been kind of derived. Yeah. From them. So it's like A plus B equals C. I see this woman, she's young, she's making paintings of people. So what is the story? Yeah. Um, and, and that is important. My story is important. And I, I think that your story is important, but it's just as important the, the unconscious state that we have to enter to kind of make the work be, which is I have to leave all that at the door. Otherwise I'd get nothing done. Yeah. Uh, I would, yeah, I would become really stagnant. So I'm productive because I'm not thinking about those things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, certainly when you're writing fiction and, and if you're not writing about if you're writing, the default is considered writing about white people. So if you're not writing about white people, you have to distinguish, uh, I think, the race and, and the culture of, of your characters. And in the same way, I think if you're not painting white people, then you get asked essentially in, in a backdoor way why you're not painting white people, you yeah. know? And yeah. that really is, it, it, that kind of, the fact that, you know, we still have to, to move past that, that first sort of initial battery of questions is, is tedious. Yeah, and I definitely had that in grad school. I very explicitly recall being in a critique and the question was like, you know, why aren't you painting white people? And I was like, well, there's more than enough already in the world as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, and the thing that I, I am interested in is kind of that which I know most intimately. I'm, I'm interested in intimacy um, yeah. at its yeah. depth. And the only way that I can tap into it most honestly for myself is to tap into my own experiences and what I know. 
Well, you know, but I do want to ask, you know, there has been this theory recently that the return of portraiture, spe specifically made by people of color, is a kind of subconsciously or not a historical correction, you know, because it argues that the type of person who was once the subject of a portrait, you know, which was typically someone rich or powerful or grand or typically white, needs to be revisited. And yep. so it means that in museums these days, um, where you wouldn't five years ago have seen black faces or brown faces or trans faces on the walls, you now see these people being put into the institution. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what drew you to portraiture specifically? You seem to approach it as kind of a personal outreach project first and then an artistic one. And I'm struck by when you read, when I read interviews with you about how all the stories begin with, I saw so-and-so and I, I wanted to paint her rather than I had an idea of painting so-and-so. Yeah, that's very, I'm, uh, wow. You're absolutely right. I think you're the first to kind of nail that in its exactness because I am the kind of person who's always, since I was six months old, my mother would describe that I was looking out for my brother, that I was always kind of acutely aware of those who were around me. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious about them. I think my curiosity always existed outside of myself first. Mm -hmm. That curiosity absolutely drives kind of how the practice has evolved. I think what drew me to painting and probably painting portraiture, portraiture initially was just like, a, a safe space to kind of practice to have stillness to where I'm unconsciously not conscious, you know what I mean? That that act in and of itself was my original safety and, and approaching making to begin with. But portraiture, it was really wanting to know and understand people on a deeper level than what they were giving me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the people who were around me, my family, my friends, um, the people that I walked past on the street, painting became an excuse to like, say hi and then mm -hmm. get to know somebody that otherwise I think my introversion would have won and mm -hmm. I wouldn't have ever said anything at all and missed out an opportunity altogether. I mean it's clearly an act of intimacy and you know I wanted to ask you, you, you paint from photographs and I wanted to talk to you about what painting can do that photography can't. You know so in other words why painting and I always think about that um, quote from Diane Arbus where she says I think it does a little hurt to be photographed. And I love the reluctance in that statement. Does it hurt to be painted in the same way? You know, is, is, it, is one more intimate? Is one more exploitative? You know, you've talked about, you know, you talk so lovingly about these, about these people who you form a kinship with because, because you are looking at their image, but is painting ultimately more dignified for the subject? I mean, everything in me doesn't want to say yes because there are so many photographers I admire, like the artist Sawu Bay comes yeah, to mind yeah. immediately where I, I think there's no way that I could describe his portraits as lacking something yeah. my paintings are gaining. For me personally, I can only speak from like what it is that I'm gaining. And that's maybe the selfish thing in kind of making in general too, is that I, I need the time that painting allows to get mm. to someone. I've always been someone who has never felt fully understood in an instant. <laughs> um, and as a result, I think that most of us probably ultimately feel that way, that there's no way to kind of discern who someone is just by a, a flash of a camera. For me and, and my understanding of them, that it takes time, it takes patience, it takes real engagement. And the painting practice thoroughly allows me to kind of engage in those kind of processes that, that I get to sit and be and think and engage on a longer time frame. So mm -hmm. the biggest difference maybe is to color, maybe, but also time. Time is like the mm -hmm. most important part. I also love the ability to kind of like create an object that has my literal hands embedded in it, that yeah. every brushstroke is my, my gesture towards love, is my gesture towards understanding, is my gesture towards um, kind of getting at something more intimate as we're describing than a photograph would allow singularly. And I take photographs as reference materials for my paintings. And my partner is a photographer and it wasn't until I started dating him that like I started to care a little bit more about the photographs because I would just print them on copy paper. I cared not at all. And he's like, you're losing so much detail. And yeah. I was like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. The, the photograph is so secondary to what it is that I'm after. Yeah. Um, the fact that I don't see some things doesn't bother me. It's not about that kind of replication. It's about kind of tapping into something unseen. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there is such, well, first of all, I have to say, I, one of the other things I find really interesting about, about your process is that you begin with spotting someone, you, you know, you ask to take their picture, you ask to paint them. It's a lot of asks along the way, which I thought was really, there's a lot of um, consent. I mean, to use a term that, you, you know, is, is I think appropriate here. And then you bring them to the show. So it's a complete arc of an experience. You know, it's not just like, well, I painted you goodbye. It's yeah. actually bringing them into a space that they never thought they'd go before. I was struck when you were talking to Thelma Golden about how you said a lot of people, there was one in particular, was it George, who hadn't been to the museum. He knew of it, but he yeah. hadn't been. And so it actually pulls someone, you know, from one location and puts them in another. Yeah. And yet in that other foreign location, there they are on the wall. Yeah. And I found that very, very moving. Yeah, I think it's integral to who I am. I think I, I'm always wanting people to be comfortable. I am a nurturer <laughs> by nature in the sense that I, I always want people to feel safe and comfortable around me. And oftentimes that can be to my own detriment because I do think outside of myself so much. But it is an important part of getting to know people. And then saying, and the joke kind of is like, I saw Dr James on the street I'm sorry. Yeah. It was like a beautiful day on Saturday and something in me just knew he was going to be out in front of Sylvia's. He hasn't been there in a really long time. And so we, we rode up on a Revel scooter and I hopped off the back of the, the scooter, <laughs> looked at me like, who's this woman running up? And then as soon as I did, he flung, you know, we kind of had our general kind of engagement. Yeah. But I, I said to him, you won't be able to shake me if you try when I first met him. Yeah. And I and I even took it as literally as it ultimately has become is now I can't shake him. You right. know, I think I said like, you can't shake me. Right. But I similarly can't shake thinking about and wondering and being involved in the lives of the people that I've gotten to know through yeah. this process and keeping them involved. I, I was checking with him to make sure he knows how to access the new museum if he wants to go back, that he's yeah. confident about what the new protocol is. That that's an important part for me is that they kind of, I become a bridge perhaps. Um, between yeah, yeah, which which I love, and it's very conscious, and I think it's even. I mean, not that your art is performance art, but that is, you know, that is as much a part of I think the process uh, as painting is itself, right? It's it's this reaching out and holding on um, yeah. and never letting go. Yeah, and I think there's something as you, we were talking before we got on screen, but thinking about the work that we're doing in our various practices, right? That there's a conscious act of being in in the world and kind of. Um, resolving the way that you want others to be treated and then yeah. enacting that yeah. um, in the way that you want to be and really kind of committing to a uh, way of being in the world. Yeah. And it's not, yes, it, it's performative because I have, I mean, there's elements of it that feel performative because I have a platform where I talk about it a lot, but would it be performative if I didn't have a platform? Yeah, I, I misspoke. It's not performative. It's, it is part of it's an activation of the painting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't necessarily think performative is the wrong word because I often think of like the, the the art world is requiring a performance of me at times. Like there's a performance aspect. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Probably those engagements are the least performative somehow. Yes. Well, which I want to get to, but I did want to ask, you know, there's such a generosity in your gaze and you can just see looking at it that there's a connection to your subject. Could you paint someone you didn't like? That's an interesting question. I mean, what's hard is I don't, I, I literally in my head was like, first of all, who do I not like? Is there anyone like that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I mean, do you need that kind of, when you meet them, is there a click? I mean, is there an instant moment yeah. of yeah, sympathy? And with a, that, that consent pit. So it yeah. comes for me with a, a mutual gaze and we all feel it when you're on the train, when you're moving through space and you look yeah. at someone yeah. and you feel like you're, you can rest in their eyes rather yeah. than run from them. Like there are moments where you feel safe and there are moments where you don't. And there's yeah. moments I just have to trust those instinctual kind yeah. of gazes that I have with people. And that it's that instant that I'm like, oh, they're gonna welcome my approach. Yeah. Um, and from that approach, they might welcome a photograph. And from that photograph, they might welcome, you know, a continuum of relationship. But it all starts with that kind of like looking up, a literal looking yeah. up. Yes. Trying to meet the eyes of other people. The literal gaze of one another has yeah. to start somewhere. Um, right. For me, it, it starts with that initial welcome. Um, and, and there are people who look away. Like there are times that people mm -hmm. look at me and I'm like, Ooh, we all do that intentionally. Like I'm like, oh, I'm not ready for this today. Don't look at me. Like I'm gonna keep it moving. Um, I think 
Falu was resisted your advances at first, right? And you went back. Um, uh, you made her make eye contact. Was that true? Well, Falu, no, Falu, I don't think it was Falu. I can't remember who it was now, though. It might have been James. I kept coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, Falu was always like, "When are you gonna paint me?" She yeah, was yeah, that's right, like, that's she was so game from day one. Um, yeah. and at that point, I hadn't. I was still grappling with the idea of painting a physical representation of the feminine form in any capacity in a painting. That I knew that I, I felt the feminine always existed within the work because I felt so present mm -hmm. in it in my own identity and reckoning with that. But I. Falu was the first person who kind of like sought me out mm. and was like, I know what you're doing out in these streets and I want to be a part of it. And I was mm. like, okay, like, I'm not sure how you're going to fit. And then finally it was like, let's just, yeah, I don't know what I'm waiting for. Like yeah. I've created barriers in my mind that are also blocking me from having the opportunity to kind of like dive in. But yeah. we were friendly without a doubt up until that point. Right, right. I think it was, there, there definitely been probably, oh, S Stanley was like, nah. Stanley. Yeah. Yeah. You can see that in his painting. Yeah, like, yeah, you can. You can. You can see the reticence. Yeah. It's nice that you honored that reticence too. You know, I mean, it's it takes a brave painter to show the subject's suspicion and wariness. Yeah. You know? I think it's fair. I, they're human. I think yeah. that's also part of the experience of painting the everyday for me and not yeah. going into it with a preconceived notion of what it is that I'm after. Yeah. Is that I'm just meeting people where they are. That's part yeah. of is just going to where the people are and seeing how they feel. Well, you know, it, it, that's that leads me to another question. You know, um, you know, at T, we've long covered black artists who depict black people in their work, and we're doing a story about the playwright August Wilson, um, the renowned American playwright, who wrote a ten-play cycle called the Pittsburgh Cycle, with one play uh, devoted to every decade of the twentieth century, and which Denzel Washington is now adapting to film one by one. And one of the points that the writer Maya Phillips makes in the story is that one reason that the works are so revolutionary is because Wilson's characters are neither exemplars nor villains, and they're not meant to stand in for the extremes of the race. You know, they're everyday flawed people, and it's their everyday lives that make them compelling, you know, because of their everydayness and not in spite of that. And you've seen that across artistic mediums. I mean, you mentioned um, Dawa Bay, who I think is a touchstone for both of us. And the, again, the work was so revelatory in one way. I mean, A, he's a brilliant technical photographer, but B, it was, it was rigorously everyday people. Yeah. And you know, you've talked about your dedication of capturing people, and I think you put it really beautifully, who exist just outside the frame. Yeah. And you know, will you talk a little about the kinds of subjects you look for and this idea of the everyday black person as the star of these uh, various artistic projects of yours? Yeah, I think my my own awareness to paying attention to the people behind the curtains started yeah. fairly young. That I had real modeling in my parents and in my family of um, what it means to recognize, like, for example, COVID has really produced this moment where everybody claps at seven o'clock for the essential. Yeah. The people who came to light in this moment were the people that were probably disregarded and unconsidered up yeah. until this moment. The people yeah. hadn't realized that the ecosystem of their lives was really thriving on the lives of other people making that happen, who were yeah. completely invisible to them otherwise. And I think that those systems, I was really kind of made aware of at a young age um, that I've had many opportunities where literally my mother walked me into the cafeteria in college and was like, yeah, we are the president, fine, like, cool. Yes, you should know who she is, but yeah. the person you need to know is gonna be the person who feeds you every day, who's yeah. been here for 60 years versus the president who's been here for four, who's gonna yeah. tell you the ins and outs and like actually have your back. That those yeah. are the people who are the lifeblood of yeah. all the spaces and places that we occupy. They're the people who are cleaning the halls. They're the people yeah. We walk by on the street that we don't give any regard to, but are, are a part of our, our shared space. And their energy is gonna always affect our energy. And if you don't see them and give them the platform that they deserve by introducing yeah. yourself from the start, then yeah. you're, you're, you're confused. Your yeah. stars have blinded you in essence, that it's like the, the, the soul exists for me in, um, the most human parts of ourselves and even celebrities or as I have kind of reckoned with my own kind of visibility these days, there are moments where I really understand 
the importance of kind of have being seeing the, the entirety of a human being. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's there's a lot that brings us to this moment. Yeah. Um, and that's just kind of like my philosophy is, is and kind of sense of being in the world is recognizing that what brought you here today with me and what happened before 645 when we logged in um, yeah. is just as important as this moment we are sharing now and, and the yeah. same for the people around us. Yeah, and I think it's that sense of, of humbleness and, and humility that really does inform the work. And, you know, one of the things I found very interesting about your um, one of your interviews in, in your beautiful catalog is that you said that at one point, the photos that you paint from help me not to invent anything, not to make anything up. I'm not imagining or adding language, props, or a symbology that wasn't already there. You know, and as someone who spends her artistic life you know, wildly lying all of the time. You know, I found this fascinating because, you know, have you ever been, well, first of all, is it philosophically important for you to not embroider or, or embellish a portrait even for the sake of aesthetics? I mean, have you ever been attempted to or is portraiture a kind of reportage for you? I think that I'm embellishing all the time. There is a wonkiness to the way that I represent things or the freedom in which I'm not gritting the portraits as I prepare them. The mm. images for me become the catalyst that I don't want to ignore, that there is a clear guideline for who this person is and what is important to them that I need to honor. Right. But with that, I am also acknowledging my relationship to them. So I have, I consider color and skin and thinking about the way that I've changed skins or the freedom that I feel around representing color in general and flip flopping the color of space is really important. Sometimes they'll be like, I don't know, a favorite book that they pointed out on my way out that I'll take a picture of that I'll move into the frame, but wasn't a part of that original photo, like a singular photograph. So I do feel that I allow myself a certain amount of like, artistic freedom. Mm -hmm. I just allow myself a whole lot of room to imagine who they are. I try to yeah. see them for who they are as they presented themselves to me yes. and then, uh, reflect back my experience of them, if that makes sense. Have you ever been tempted to, to disobey that, to, to make someone into something else because it seems like a better artistic story? No, quite honestly, I don't, I don't know if I have. I think there are um, might be directives that somebody will give me uh, that feel, I don't know, like really imposing in a way that I think is wrong, <laughs> that yeah. they might, that I might lessen the importance of that thing. Like, for example, there was a painting where the lamp was really bright and the subject said, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to be overshadowed by that lamp. And them saying that sort of prompted me to have a sense of play within the work that I allowed myself to think about color and what would it mean if the lamp kind of came alive in a really explicit way and the figure kind of became a mosaic in its own sort and its own kind of extensive language. So there are decisions that I'm making based off of the engagement that I have with someone. Um, so I do allow myself the freedom in that sense, like mm -hmm. where I, I sometimes push back um, if someone has pushed into what I feel is my space as well, that it is. It's, as much as it is a consent uh, and it's a collaboration in that consent too. And I want people to feel safe in trusting me, um, but trusting me as a part of it as well, um, which is scary. I mean, having my own portrait painted by my friend, Wade McIntosh, I was like horrified, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, that was the first time that I was on the other side of the table. I know how hard it is to be yeah. seen by someone else. Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, the thing I, I, I think that we, all find so compelling about portraiture is that it really is one of the oldest forms of artistic representation. I mean, there have been portraitists and sitters for as, as, as long as time, you know, in every culture. And that exchange between the sitter and, and the painter or the drawer or the etcher, whoever it was, is an eternal one. And you're part of that long, 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 you know, um, history of, of, of being in that, in, in that duality. Oh, which absolutely. Is special, you know? I mean it's super intimidating, but it's also, yeah. you know, uh, it's intimidating in the sense that, it, especially in graduate school, it's like, what are you going to do that's different than anybody else? You know, like, yeah, yeah, we've all seen a portrait before. We've seen many paintings of people. Yeah. Why is what you're doing at, at any of any importance? And there was part of me that similarly was like, I don't know. There are times I'm in the studio now where I'm like, why does this matter? This past yeah. week, you, we were having this conversation last week. I would have been like, 
who cares? You know, yeah. literally, who cares about painting? This is a stupid way to spend my time. But then there's also this moment where I come right back to why I do it. And it's the moment where we describe someone coming into the museum for the first time and seeing themselves or yeah. someone feeling safe within a representation that they, even if it's not their literal representation, it feels like it encompasses a piece of their truth. And that's yeah. worth it in the end. I mean, do you feel that it is, you are part of, I mean, I know this isn't conscious for you, but an institutional correction in that sense? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. There, in my unconscious state of making the painting, I also come out of it and, and you know, I studied sociology and anthropology long enough and came from a family of um, really social philanthropists and social activists in their own kind of capacity that, yeah, I, I'm fully aware of what these paintings mean. I, but because of that, I have tried to be as responsible as possible that I, before I even put paint to canvas and representing a black and brown body, particularly the black male body when I started the Visible Man series. Wow. I was like, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I am knowledgeable, that I am prepared, that I am capable, and I'm going to be respectful of these bodies in a way that historically they've been completely disregarded. That I, I recognize the history of portraiture as it relates to their bodies, and I want to bring something different to that. So I'm just going to sit and read for, you know, a month. And that was kind of jarring in graduate school that people came in and I was like reading and highlighting. Um, but that was an important part of the practice for me that I needed to be thoughtful um, through and through. That yeah. My unconsciousness doesn't mean that I'm without thought. Yeah, I mean, you said something that I really loved about how the very size of your paintings means that people have to acknowledge the body and the face within them, you know? And so it means that the mostly black faces in your work becomes something that the viewer is both invited to engage with but also forced to reckon with, you know? And I love this idea that the picture is demanding physical and psychological space. And that was part of it. After all my reading, there was like a short list of things. The gaze, yeah. one of them, I was yeah. like, no matter where these paintings go, recognizing the system that they're going in in a conscious thought of the system that they will be potentially participating in, which will be white walls and white institutions, yeah. Yeah. Directors, that I wanted them to be active participants in whatever space they yeah. were. And that people could never ignore them, that they yeah. would be, kind of engaging the the spaces that they were in and asking people to engage back. Mm -hmm. So the gaze, I never wanted there to be a downturn gaze as it related to the large scale full figure portraits, especially yeah. the people that I kind of know and meet. And the yeah. size and the scale was the other part of it. That I loved, like, I, I'm goofy um, in a lot of ways and, my, and awkward and my sense of humor came out in the scale. I liked the idea that people would have to literally make room for these like giant paintings of black people. Like, like literally unapologetically, like you're gonna have to move something else over and you're yeah. gonna have to live with this. Like yeah. you're gonna commit to, to participating in this life and participating in the journey of this painting long-term by making space for them um, and finding yeah. Them. Yeah, I mean, when I saw them, what really, and especially when you see them all in a room, the thing I really got, was tickled by and moved by is you literally have to back up to see them. So it makes, it makes you, the viewer, engage physically, you know, and they're superhero size, you know, and, and that really changes, it knocks you off your center of gravity. Like if you just kind of want to, you know, breeze through the room, just kind of looking at everything at eye level, you can't. If you yeah, have yeah. to, you've got to move. They're not going to move for you. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. an unapologetic sense to them. And I love the idea that then somebody has to like get close and then their experience when they get close to it too becomes almost these abstract fields that there's yeah. real topography in the way that the application of paint builds on top of each other. The folds of the fabric, for example, yeah. the way that I build the folds is like a topographical map and that I'm getting oh. white marks and I'm building up layers of color and thickness. And, and you can get lost in that too. I love the idea that you get lost in your own sense of self and space as you back up. And then you get lost in your own sense of self and space as the security guard tells you to back up. You know, yeah. like the yeah. both things are happening at the same time. Um, as you kind of dance, you're really kind of dancing and, and trying to understand who the person is in front of you. Yeah, and that's very, that's, and, and you know, and, and your understanding of it ebbs and flows as you move in and out. Um, so it, you're right, it, it becomes a real physical engagement and understanding, and that understanding is always shifting. Absolutely. You know, one of the things, um, Derek, can you cue up some of the Visible Man um, paintings, please? You know, one of the things that we've seen over the past um, few years 
in paintings by black artists or actually the past few decades has been very different approaches to depicting black skin, you know, including approaches, uh, portraits that made blackness itself, the color, a metaphor, or that reclaim the word in a visual context. And the black skin in your work um, is so deeply nuanced and it's made of different planes and blends and colors. And it's made, as you see here, you know, with blacks and browns and greens and blues and pinks. And would you talk a little bit about how you approach skin in your paintings? Yeah, I think there's been a real evolution and, and that evolution has become more and more nuanced, I think, but there's those explicit decisions that I was making around scale and gaze were also included in thinking about color and skin. I love the idea that people could approach a body of work of mine and say, oh, she paints black men or she paints mm -hmm. the black figure, that that's her subject matter. And then they'd have to sit back and think, oh, well, he's purple and the last mm -hmm. one green, that there's, there's kind of a different kind of engagement for the viewer, kind of like that, the same kind of dance that I'm describing mm -hmm. before. There's a kind of a mental dance occurring, mm -hmm. but also just based off my own experience of blackness and what the black experience is, that we are not a monolith. I think we've heard that a lot this week about Latinx voters, mm -hmm. especially, and black voters, that there's no monolith mm -hmm. as a group mm -hmm. in our identity and our, our sense of being in the world. There are some experiences we have potentially in common, um, but there are things that are, are nuanced. And if I look at the photo album of my own family, oh. there is a real spectrum of color mm -hmm. as it's represented, that I am more fair-skinned than my twin brother, but I am darker than my older brother and my parents. Like, there is literally a mosaic of mm -hmm. color in us. And I, I think our history and our bloodlines are complex. Mm -hmm. And I, I am interested in kind of playing and allowing myself to play with color in that way to not see again the photograph or the person in from, front of me as being um, the beginning, middle and the end that my experience of them can be represented as well in, in many shades and, mm -hmm. um, and representing kind of the inside out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're really beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I guess I said that it's changed over time because I don't think as many of the paintings have like this blue. No, that's true. And this is very it's early one. Explicit blue. I think in the beginning, it was really clear. Like I came in with a punch. Like, again, I had been reading for two months straight. So I was yeah. clear that I was gonna like do all these things. And, and now I think there's similar plays. So the way I think about color and light on the skin, but it's, it's not always as explicit as blue and green. Yeah, I mean, let me uh, let me but bounce off of this, and and Derek, you can keep this photo up. Um, you know, we're both interested in masculinity, which I don't know if this is your theory, but we both went to women's colleges, and I always have this theory that you know the years of when I should have been observing, you know, young men become young men. I was just I wasn't seeing them at all. So, you know, for the greater part of my twenties, they became a subject of you know intense fascination, unless so as I got older. But we're both interested in how masculinity expresses itself. And you know, you said you didn't want to be an artist who just painted men and you're not. But I wanted, wanted if you would talk about the special charge and the difference of painting not just men and not just nude men, um, but nude black men. You know, you've pointed out that the subjects in your early series, we're seeing one here from Visible Man, many of them were acting students at Yale and therefore likely had a greater familiarity with their body as a vehicle for expression than the average man would. Um, but is the experience of painting men for you as a woman fundamentally different than painting other genders? I think it's a really, my charge for making that work was and is complicated as you, I'm sure it was for you to write your book was part of the, the stack of books that gave me permission to feel that my experience and relationship as a, as a woman to the masculine energy that mm -hmm. I was trying to understand um, mm -hmm. was important, that it was a worthwhile subject to engage in, that my gaze upon their bodies and trying to understand would offer something different than maybe um, if it were just a man painting them. Yeah, There were a few kind of steps at play in my head. I knew that particularly as it relates to the black male body that I wanted um, there to be no blocks to understanding their humanity. For the viewer to approach their body, I wanted them to feel as um, 
yeah, as intimately connected as I feel to my brothers and my family members, the literal people that I love and that I know. And it's not about anything other than sharing space in a way that you don't necessarily always get to see, that there are things yeah. that we keep for those closest to us. And I, I did ask that of people who didn't know me all that well. Um, and it was a real act of trust on their part to say, yes, come in, photograph me. I was really explicitly kind of communicating that I didn't want to show their genitalia. Mm -hmm. That was not going to be a prominent part of the painting, mm -hmm. um, but that I wanted them in their most intimate spaces. So their homes and I went to their homes and I let them be and go and sit wherever they wanted to sit and pull the things that were most important to them. But I do think as a woman, especially as women having attended women's colleges, mm -hmm. um, I, I was of interest to you as well, like the draw and the drive to do that. I think there was something and is something that I will never understand about their experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. but I, as close to it, I could see myself as close to it as, any, as anybody else, that I had um, access through the lens of my family members mm -hmm. that would be different than maybe the people listening right now. You know, mm -hmm. it is different. But I, if I could share what I know of them with the people listening and watching and viewing the work, like how would I do it? Mm -hmm. And I had to strip them of all distractions. <laughs> Literally, I, I had to kind of reconcile um, my own vulnerability with them and theirs to me as well, that they're, there's a disarming that takes place. Yeah, that's exactly the right word. I think that's exactly the right word. And you know, you mentioned you were in, you studied anthropology, and it also this is a kind of anthropology, but the word is often associated with a kind of coldness, and there's nothing of that there. No. But there is a kind of of curiosity, you know, and one yeah, think sociology and anthropology is yeah. based on an yeah. understanding of those outside of our immediate right. realm and yeah. the and the people around us. Yeah. Um, and just taking time. It's just like taking time to understand. Yeah. Well, I, you know, we have a 15 minute warning, which is too bad because I have a lot to get through. But I did want to ask you, I want to switch gears a little bit. And I wanted to ask you about the public persona of being an artist. You know, I think we all have this idea of the artist alone in her studio, which, you know, has never been true. Um, yeah. As much as I can romanticize it, you know, but, if, but the, these days, because of social media, the artist has to become a figure and a personality. And do you feel that yourself, it, were you aware of having to invent a public self? And is it, is it difficult for you? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, for many things, I think for on, on many levels. I often say to my students that like, we have this tool in our hands. You have access as we talk about them leaving school. Yeah. What, what is their pathway to getting their work in front of people? And yeah. I think in the past five, 10 years, but especially in the past five years, we've really gotten access to viewing what is happening in people's most intimate spaces like in the palm of our hands. Now we got Zoom, like I'm in your, I don't know, study, like yeah. you're in my studio, like you can have a studio visit and a talk at the same time where normally we would be maybe on a stage in a very kind of constrained or set yeah. space, but yeah. now our spaces have kind of expanded and, and there is a sense of wanting to know. Now we've kind of gotten a peak, so people yeah. want to know more. And so I think my challenge has been, um, how much do I share? How much do I keep sacred? In, in a lot of ways, I am the studio, like the artist alone in her studio because I am a bit of a recluse. I've always kind of been, I've always been on the periphery or I've always felt or perceived myself to be on the periphery. So to be drawn in when I have always internally always felt on the outside has been a, a little topsy-turvy. I have felt wow. extremely awkward navigating um, the kind of public sphere of being an artist. I think artist to celebrity is a new thing, especially visual artists. Like yeah. what, what does it mean? Or I, like I, even playwrights, I'm sure every artist, writers, we're all kind of experiencing this across all realms. Cause as I'm like thinking about my friends who are playwrights, like actors yeah. were like the only visible creative people that we understood as celebrities. Like yeah. in my head, it was like, if you're an actor, you're a celebrity, right. but an artist like, no, like you only know about them in an art history book. But now like my students are telling me about artists who have 
millions of followers and are like that celebrity and there's a getting yeah. to know whether I, I've seen their work or not. Um, and, and yeah, it's been hard. I think that there are moments where my own friends have this vision of what my life is and yeah. so don't call. Like the greatest struggle has been like people assume that I'm like living in New York and completely like too busy for everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought I'm telling them I'm literally sitting on the floor eating Domino's pizza to my partner's demise and like feeling sad because I'm feeling isolated. Like there's 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 a confliction with feeling very public and then yeah. feeling very alone. Yeah. Um, and and reconciling that is like a journey that I'm, yeah. I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Jeremy O'Harris has ruined it for everyone. I mean, because he really is a brilliant, you know, artist and he actually is very extroverted and very socially skilled. And this is a playwright for those of you who don't know. And he's just, but he's one in a million. And I yeah, always tell her. As I was like, yeah, I have friends. Yes, and that's what I wondered. Yeah. <laughs> like, really like, that, that personality is not normal. Like most playwrights I know are alone. They're depressed. They're crying. You know, they're eating food that they found, you know, at the bottom of, you know, of the, of, of the bin yeah. in the refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he really has ruined it for all introverts. Um, yeah. and, and most artists are introverts, I think. Yeah. You know, I think you know. that they're, which is why we communicate in these other forms. Yeah. So we yeah. find our voice really powerfully in the act of writing or creating in various capacities. It is, yeah. it's a challenge, but I, I think that I've, I've been trying to be graceful about it. I've been trying to be honest um, yeah. with myself and with others. I think there were things that three years ago I would have said I will never talk about publicly that now I'm recognizing I, I don't need to hide either. Yeah. You know? Like I, I think being really honest about who I am is, is as much as I'm, that's what the work is. Like, why would I keep that from? Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. It's it takes a while, I think, as as a young artist, especially a young artist who's become successful and recognized well deservedly, but very quickly to figure out what their persona is. And it's harder these days to walk back being public, you know. I mean, I would love to be Jeremy, you know, I would but you know, but again, most of us are not. And you know, you know, my other question to you is one of the people, one of the groups of people I'm most interested in is the mid-career artist. We focus on on that person a lot at T. You know, that 50-year slog of making work again and again and again and again and again. And that's real, that is a kind of, of heroism, I think, you know, that that mid-career artist. And do you have a role model as a mid-career artist, either either because of the artistry or because of how they've conducted or lived their lives as an artist? Well, Dawood Bay was um, and is like the first to come to mind and maybe yeah. that's also because we've talked about him, but he, I think it's also a very fair and reasonable, it is, it is a feat. I mean, mid-career artists at this point are the people that I'm like, okay, how, do, how have they been able to sustain? It is about endurance, it's yeah. endurance of the work, it's endurance and it's integrity. Yeah. Um, and that consistency around its integrity, even in my own failures and recognizing that the failures are opportunities to kind of get back up, dust up and, not, and the resiliency to kind of like stand yeah. up and try again. Yeah. Um, because I, I, that is what I admire most by those who have sustained any career. Mark Bradford is somebody yeah. who I think about as well. Like he just yeah. came to mind as someone who is working on many different, and he came into his practice a little later in life but has really sustained his own kind of creative endeavors and willingness to kind of reinvent himself. Yeah. So absolutely, the Harlem um, series, the photographs that he took in yeah. Harlem, which was like profoundly different for him. Yeah. Like it was yeah. this moment of reckoning that he, he has continued to surprise me. The landscapes, I don't know anything about photography, which would have my, but like the photographs are really dark. So I don't know anything about the phot photographic process. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, they're like, yeah. like the landscapes, in and they're the um it's like the lights and the darks are all mixed up so yeah i mean those are such striking works too yeah. i mean oh, the, the thing i i mean I, you know i love dawa bay's work and one of the things i love and i think is very hard as a mid-career artist especially if you found a success in one form is to be brave enough to fail spectacularly and and that means taking big chances and doing things um you know where it might not work and so the people I really admire are people who have really tried to push themselves to do different things, you know, yeah. and it's very, very hard to do. I mean, there was 
there's a speech that Michael Shaban once give, gave at the Whiting Writers Awards. And he said that you, ha you have to, pre you have to act, when you're writing, you have to act as if you're dead, if, as if it's gonna be published posthumously, because that's the only way, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that's the only way you'll be brave enough to say what you want, what you really should be saying. And I think that is something that, you know, I, I always think about too, that you should, you should create as if you're going to die before it comes out. I love that. Like yeah. I got goosebumps sort of, because I think that that is, that comes back to the truth. Like yeah. without any pressure, without any kind of sense of necessity or survival or navigating a system or cultural relevant, all that becomes irrelevant. It's like, yeah. who are you and what do you need yeah. to say? Yeah, yeah. And, and what are you, it is the hardest thing to quiet the voices, you know, in 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 your head, and they're always there. You think you can block them out, but they're always there. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think we only have a few more minutes, but I did want to ask you. You know, you come from a long line of educators and um, people involved in social justice, including your your grandfather, and you yourself are a professor at Rutgers. And what do you feel your mission is as a teacher? You know, you've talked about how when you went to Yale, you couldn't, you said, you'd, I didn't know how to paint, but you knew how to see. And mm -hmm. so when you're teaching, what can you teach as, as, as an art teacher? What is I mean, I start class by coming in saying there is going to be 90% of the time that I don't know how to answer whatever question right. you have about technical right. kind of stuff. <laughs> I have friends on speed dial for that. I still use those friends, right? Like there are things that I still don't know about paint and the material of paint mm -hmm. and the material stretches or stretching a canvas or kind of choosing a surface. There's a lot to learn for me there too. And that for me, I, I try to start my time in the classroom by making it utterly clear that there is no, I know more than you. But that doesn't exist in this space, that even I am on a learning playing field with them. So collectively that we are in um, an act of learning, that my goal for them is to try to keep their curiosity and their desire to learn and their desire to um, believe in themselves and to stretch themselves to seek learning um, is the most important skill that they can have, whether they paint or not, is irrelevant to me. I don't care if they become painters. I would love for them to, but it's probably also not realistic. But this thing that I can offer them, like you said, is a way of seeing, a way yeah. of being, a way of knowing themselves, mm -hmm. most importantly, and, and taking that into the world with confidence. A if I can get them to move from my space into another with an, a hair more confidence than they had when they first entered, then I consider myself successful. And that mm -hmm. confidence presents itself in a myriad of ways. It's not just the way they're putting a brush to canvas. Painting is just a conduit for us to have a lot of difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that like they're, they often kind of see me i last week we were doing a class on like what's next so we just like created a brainstorm of all the different things that they could do and the questions that they have and showed my resume and talked about how to write like things that are seemingly mundane yeah to the us who have had the privilege of moving yeah. through space and, and having our resumes accepted but yeah. it's quite frequently not a skill that is taught or shared yeah, I agree. I mean, you talked, you know, you came from a family in which art was valued and, you know, you've talked about your, you know, your, your parents were artistic, if, if not artists, so were mine. And yeah. I think one of the things I really admire about so many people who enter arts in any field is the real audacity that they have to think of this as a life for themselves. Oh, like, yeah. if you don't grow up thinking of it as a possibility, no one's taught you it's a possibility, you've got to learn that for yourself. And that's a Really, that's a special kind of phrase. Between us and the people that we see as being more successful is their yeah. egos have allowed them to think that they have the capacity to do what they're doing. Okay. Yeah, that's um, right. And it's it's that's the confidence is also a bit of ego, taming yeah. the ego, but also recognizing the ego and kind of stoking it and yeah. recognizing that, yeah, what you have to say is valuable. It's always yeah. valuable. And if you sit in the back of the room and you listen for a time, that is also valuable, but know yeah. that your voice is welcome here in whatever capacity you bring it. Um, but all too often the noise cancels out and it comes, it's full circle. It's like the periphery, the noise cancels out that which is most important, which are often the people sitting quietly, taking it in, who yeah. have something more profound to say because they've observed it all than the person who's just like screaming and yelling in front of us. No, it's true. And, and you know, it takes, it, it, it takes a 
privilege to be able to say, well, I have something to contribute and I'm going to go ahead and say it. Yeah. You know, it's actually saying it or it's painting it or it's writing it yeah. or it's whatever. Yeah. You know? yeah, however you're moving through space. Yeah. It's a privileged state of being to think this is how, which is why like, like there are times where even I in the studio, I'm like, why is this? Why do I think that I matter so much to spend my time painting? Yeah. It's, like, who cares? Like, who cares? Like, there's, like, what? Like there are people dying. Like I don't, I don't know how to reckon that. All yeah, I mean, I have to say, like, listen. I mean, we have two more minutes, but I did want to say this, and I want to hear your thoughts. On a certain level, I get really tired of these stories that have to be written every few years, especially during moments of crisis, about about why art matters. Yeah. If it's not fundamentally clear that the the need to produce art is something that has mattered to every culture through since the beginning of time, then I really don't know what else to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and but the harder the harder thing to do is that I think people like you are making headway on is is saying that it is it is for you know it is for anyone to make not everyone can be an artist but anyone can be you yeah. know exactly exactly because it is it's a it's a mindset more than mm -hmm. it is anything else and there I say that in, in a very privileged space as like Jordan Castile but it is like there is there is also something that will be with you forever, whether you acknowledge it or not, when you can step into space and be like, yeah, my ideas and my way of making and seeing the world matters. Well, so as a final question, I would ask you, what advice do you have for young artists? Um, sign up That's for my- no. spot. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, oh, I mean, that it's such an important question. And I think it does tie into kind of the conversation that we're having right yeah. now. And, and just nothing happens without the work. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, I think you're right. Nothing happens without the work. And if even if you feel like you're making it in isolation and nobody's seeing and cares, it, it, it cannot happen. Change cannot happen without the work. And that's yeah. the work of artists, that's our work of writers, that's the work of playwrights, of theater, yeah. all of it is necessary. The work of politicians, nothing yeah. happens without committing to the work, whatever your work might be. So just commit and make it and That's keep right. making it until somebody pays attention. Somebody will, eventually somebody will. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Jordan, um, yeah. I have so many more questions, but so now we just have to actually get together. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna say, we'll uh, just have a happy hour after this. Yeah, I would love that. Awesome. But yeah. thank you, you know, it was a real honor. And again, it was, you know, I, I, I got to ask you things I've always wanted to and, um, it's, it's, I'm a huge admirer of yours and I can't wait to see what you're going to be doing in the, in the coming months and years. Likewise, we need you, we appreciate you and we see you, Hanya. Thank you for the work you are doing truly as well because it is profoundly important. Um, and as an editor, especially, I think that it's easy, to, it's, you know, we know you're there, but you're putting other people's work, you're putting work like mine um, in the hands of all people to see. And your work is, I'm sending it out. I mean, I already told you, I've been giving your book to everybody in the moment. Thank you. Thank you. And tell your brother, thank you too. No, legit. Like you, <laughs> he said, how do I read anything after this? And he sent me a list of like 20 books and I was like, nothing will be the same. Just accept it. Like you just can't. <laughs> yeah. Your twin or your, or your other brother? My older brother. My older brother. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. Thank, thank you, Hania. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, New Museum. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Derek.